really a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Will Oliver. I'm a professor of electrical engineering and computer science and a professor of physics here at MIT. And uh, very, very pleased to be here uh, for the fifth, I guess, birthday of MIT.nano. And very pleased to be on the stage with four leaders in the area of quantum information science and technology. Um, I'll give a brief, very brief introduction to each one, and then I've also asked them to give a self-introduction uh, as, as we go through this uh, panel session today on quantum science and engineering. Um, really pleased to be joined by uh, Professor Aram Harrell, Professor of Physics, um, uh, Professor Paula Capolaro, who is a Professor of Nuclear Science and Engineering as well as of Physics, um, Professor Kevin O'Brien, Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, and Dr. Jeff Grover, who is a, a research scientist and principal investigator um, in the Research Laboratory for Electronics. And so with that, you know, I hear, we, we all hear, I think, in the news and in the popular press about quantum information science, quantum computing, quantum sensing. Um, it's going to revolutionize information processing. And yet, we don't seem to have commercially scalable quantum computers yet. And, and I guess may, maybe what I'd like to do is start with Aram and just ask, what is, what is the state of quantum computing today? And where are we at? Yeah, good question. Yeah, it was th actually that last slide with all those valleys, you know, there are, there are quite a few valleys to cross. And uh, I guess they're the technical valleys and, and then also the, the commercial valleys. So on the hardware side, you've probably heard about 433 qubits, 1,000 something qubits. There are sort of two big approaches that people are scaling. Superconducting qubits, probably in the lead, with ions a little bit behind. And both of them, people have been incrementally improving them, but we still need a few architectural changes to scale them. So uh, for superconducting qubits, we still have you know, one wire per qubit, which at some point which has served us well so far, but can't go on forever. For ion traps, you have something a little bit similar. If you have a, a, a chain of ions and they have these, how do I do it, like this, you know, these breathing modes like this, uh, there's only, as you crowd more and more ions in, the modes get more and more crowded, right? So a 1D chain can't go on forever. Again, you'll have to either link together modules or, or go to a 2D architecture. And so with our current architectures, we keep on making progress. Every year, the fidelities get better and we get more qubits. And, but we still need to take the, that leap to more scalable architectures, uh, where we, which we have the ingredients for, but you know, as you know, putting everything together is, is quite challenging. And then on the algorithm side, yeah, there's still work to be done there too. And we'll, we'll keep talking about that, I think. It sounds good. Yeah. And you know, I, I hear about quantum 1.0 and quantum 2.0, and, and Paolo, what, what, what is quantum 1.0 and what is quantum 2.0? <laughs> um, well, um, I think that uh, there's sort of, uh, in some sense, uh, I don't know, category which maybe do not make so much sense, uh, but the idea is that quantum has been around for a long time. It's uh, not something new. Um, and we have actually already used quantum uh, for many applications from transistor or like uh, in my field quantum sensing, if you think of an MRI, it uses uh, spins, which are an intrinsically quantum mechanical property. So you cannot talk about spin without quantum mechanics. Uh, but at the same time, you can describe it uh, quite classically using just classical laws, and you're not really exploiting all the properties of quantum. So uh, what people define as quantum 2.0 is to really try to exploit uh, the uh, most uh, weird uh, properties of quantum mechanics, including uh, coherent superposition, uh, um, entanglement, which are correlations stronger than classical one, to achieve an advantage with respect to classical devices. And um, like, to me, there is sort of like a continuum between the two. It's not like such a clear cut. Uh, for example, uh, going back to MRI, if you're using millions of spins, you can describe it classically, but as you start to reduce down the size of the system that you're looking at, you start to see emerging effects which are more properly uh, quantum mechanical. And there is, I cannot tell you oh, up to, I don't know, 100 spin, it's classical, and below it's quantum. It's, it's really continuous. So I think that we need to embrace that, but really start to push in more all these uh, effects that can arise from the uh, more fundamental quantum properties. 
Wow, so, so quantum 2.0 sounds like we're using quantum mechanics to actually do something that we just couldn't do before. And Kevin, I'm wondering, how, how is a quantum computer different from a conventional or classical computer? So a quantum computer is different from a classical computer in, in the sense that all of the uh, bits are in, entangled. So the, the bits, instead of using something that's zero and one, it's a quantum superposition of, of zero and one. And not only that, but you have all these bits that are entangled. And, you can, and this allows you to solve some problems much more efficiently using a quantum computer than a classical computer, such as uh, the famous factoring algorithms from, from Peter Shore and, and others. Um, but this also brings up a, a massive challenge that unlike a classical computer where if you have a, a really good transistor, you can put these together to build a, a, a classical computer. For a quantum computer, you have to entangle all of, the, all of the bits in your quantum computer. And if you have some event that causes these to decohere, your computer is just gonna break. So you can make a wafer. For, we could go to MIT.nano right now, make a wafer with 500 qubits on it. Um, and, but that won't be enough to build a useful quantum computer. You have to build it in an architecture, as Aram mentioned, that allows you to entangle all these qubits. So, so those are some of the you know, power of quantum computers and also some of the challenges. So Jeff, what is, and, and maybe a question also for Aram and, and for everybody, please chime in. You know, what, what is a quantum computer good for? What, what do we envision that it's going to be able to do one day uh, that we just can't do today? And maybe importantly, what won't it do, right? What, what can it do, but also what doesn't it do? Yeah, if you could help clarify that. Um, what won't it do is maybe easier. Uh, I was just on the, in the hallway setting up my new email client and calendar from you know, upgrading to Outlook 365. And quantum computers won't do this. They won't replace like, the personal PC interaction that we're used to with word processing and, and other things. Um, but there are interesting problems related to cryptography, like was already mentioned, Peter Shor's algorithm to um, factor large numbers, which then has a relationship to uh, certain public encryption schemes. Um, so this is you know, one application that spearheaded the field. Um, there are hopes that it could help with optimization and by extension, maybe machine learning and, and other things related to this. Uh, although that becomes tenuous because we don't have like complexity theoretic guarantees that it could help, but there are, I guess, heuristic suggestions that it is powerful. Um, and then the other thing that quantum systems are good at is simulating themselves. Uh, so I think this was probably the first impetus for the field is when Richard Feynman and others had the, the light bulb idea 40 years ago that uh, quantum systems are hard to simulate classically because their state space grows exponentially as you add more particles to your quantum system. And so why not just use a quantum thing to simulate itself? And that could then have application and uh, things related to materials discovery and, and other things. So that is a very, I think, exciting avenue for, for application. Yeah, I think that was, I don't have much to add. I think quantum simulation is the most, likely to be the most important application. And I, I hope that things like quantum machine learning will, will be successful, but that's, the work there is, is more speculative at this stage. And do we, do we expect quantum computers, you know, over the coming decades to replace our conventional computers? Are they gonna work in tandem? What do you see coming downstream? Sure. Well, I guess the way Jeff put it was, was good. You know, if you think about the phone you carry in your pocket, you don't really need the processor to be very advanced, right? And, and when things are networked, most computers don't need to be very powerful. Maybe you, you care about their, uh, and they don't need a lot of storage. You know, so I, I see them as competing with supercomputers, right? And so most of us don't need to have a supercomputer at home. Even if you're doing high performance computing, you might network into a, connect remotely to a supercomputer. Uh, so I think that's the, the paradigm I would have for, for quantum computers, with a giant exception for anything related to quantum sensing. I mean, that's a whole, and maybe if a quantum computer is talking to quantum clocks or a quantum internet, that's a, that's a totally different story. But if you just wanna, for, in terms of quantum computers that solve hard problems, then they're gonna compete with things where co computing power is really the most important thing. And so that's where you, you get in. And then, you know, what do we spend a ton of computing power on? Right now, we use our supercomputers 
for quantum simulation. You know, to simulate one proton is kind of at the limits of our, the abilities of our current supercomputers. Uh, things like that, simulating the atmosphere, simulating a molecule, uh, geology, uh, all, all kinds of, of giant computing tasks are, are the ones where, where quantum computers will, you know, you'll, you'll naturally want to try them out. And you mentioned quantum sensing, and so, Paula, I'm wondering, you know, what is a quantum sensor, and, you know, how is it different than conventional sensors? What, what is the promise there? Yeah, so uh, quantum sensor, uh, from the name, of course, try again to use uh, the properties of quantum mechanics, uh, to do things that classical sensor cannot. And uh, the idea is on one side to potentially have a quantum advantage, sort of similar to the advantage that you can have with quantum computers, where as the uh, size scales for quantum sensor, you have a better scaling sensitivity than for classical sensor. Another um, like area, I think it's uh, uh, quantum sensor really enables some tasks which are not possible with classical sensor. Uh, we are here in the uh, MIT Nano uh, uh, celebration, and indeed, uh, uh, quantum sensor, because they exploit quantum system for sensing, uh, very often they're down at the nanoscale, and so they can access uh, uh, spatial resolution which are not possible with classical ones. And I think that both are really important from a very practical point of view. Um, so uh, one thing is that um, sensor, of course, uh, what we're exploiting is the very strong connection, uh, the strong interaction with the external world. So that's what you are trying to measure. And as you know, uh, quantum systems are extremely sensitive to any perturbation, and that's what you're exploiting uh, in quantum sensing. So the compromise that we sort of like uh, hold a little bit uh, uh, between um, trying to uh, control and have your quantum system interact with the external world and protecting them because they will lose their quantum character is a bit more beneficial or like a, a, a more uh, forgiving uh, for quantum sensor. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, they are sort of like nearer term uh, technologies. Uh, and uh, like they can be uh, used for uh, many uh, different applications, which is one uh, other reason uh, why for me are, are very, very interesting. And um, I think that Ara mentioned that uh, potentially quantum sensor will not need uh, um, super uh, uh, scaling like a quantum computer. At the same time, they might be able to exploit some smaller quantum computer to actually process the data that they collect, either in a, a network uh, situation or for some uh, small local uh, data analysis. So that's uh, another uh, very exciting interconnect between quantum sensing and computer. What are, what are some examples of yeah. quantum sensors and what can they measure? Yeah, so um, quantum sensor can measure um, almost about anything if you work hard enough. <laughs> um, like that said, of course, uh, uh, they are very good uh, if you wanted interacting with electromagnetic fields, that's the, the, the fourth thing. Uh, but you can use that interaction uh, to uh, then detect uh, many other things. Uh, and uh, then there are like a, a lot of sensors based on, uh, on light, uh, uh, interferometric uh, uh, sensors. So um, like examples, uh, you can, uh, as I mentioned before, take MRI and try to shrink it down to the nanoscale. So now, for example, instead of looking at the whole image of your brain, you're looking at single neurons, how they fire in a neural network and trying to figure out uh, how uh, signals are processed uh, in the brain, uh, how uh, you, a stimulus uh, is sort of like uh, uh, um, uh, on one side uh, interconnecting with uh, uh, activity in another side. Or you could uh, uh, try to do chemistry at the level of a single molecule, again, trying to identify using interaction between some uh, spins which are uh, under our control and uh, other spins in the molecules to figure out uh, the structure uh, or something or of a protein, uh, some binding sites which are relevant for uh, drug development, and so on and so forth. On the other side, we have things like uh, atomic clock that we are using. Uh, typically, they are considered under this category of quantum 1.0 because they've been around uh, for a very long time, uh, and they have enabled like, GPS navigation. But recently, um, by using ideas uh, coming from quantum information uh, in which you can have uh, better error correction, larger systems, their precision has become so uh, good that you can, for example, uh, see that there is a, um, like a gravitational effect on a 10 uh, centimeter scales. And, and then uh, that opens the way for, for example, using them to detect 
dark matter, understanding fundamental constant of the universe. So you really have, uh, in some sense, the more practical, let's say, biomedical application and the more fundamental, um, like fundamental physics application of quantum sensor and, and everything in between. And sometimes they interconnect. I, I was uh, listening to a talk uh, um, last, uh, last spring uh, where they use uh, um, a frequency comp, which had been developed, uh, for example, to detect uh, astronomical signals. Uh, to actually detect a, a COVID virus in your breath. And to me, that connection is, is just amazing. So you can really, uh, if you have people from different disciplines coming together, you can have uh, um, like a innovation which you couldn't think about. And so, so I, what I heard is that quantum sensors are, are actually nearer term mm -hmm. in terms of being commercialized and realized. And some of them are happening yep. right now and maybe quantum computing is a bit further out and we'll touch, I guess we'll touch more on where it is. Um, Kevin, your, your research I know is in superconducting qubits and, and that is an electrical circuit. Mm -hmm. um, what is a superconducting qubit and how does an electrical circuit be quantum mechanical? That's a great question, Will. Um, so before I answer that, do you mind if I go back to the question Absolutely. on comparing go classical and quantum qubits? So, so just to give an example, like your, your cell phone, you, as Aaron will, would tell you, um, you can use a quantum computer to simulate any classical problem. But as we were talking about, like, you probably shouldn't. Your, your cell phone has maybe a billion transistors, order of magnitude, operating at a clock cycle of a, about a billion operations per second. Um, a quantum computer, a, a really world-changing quantum computer, in my view, would be a few thousand qubits, a few thousand perfect logical qubits operating at, say, a few thousand operations per second. This, you could, you could probably break RSA, you could simulate some really cool chem, quant, uh, quantum mechanical systems, and you could use it to simulate classical uh, systems, but, or cl solve classical problems, but its computational power for classical problems is just so much smaller than that of, like, even a cell phone. That it just doesn't make sense to do it. You want to use quantum computers for the problems that are uniquely suited to, to quantum computers. So maybe if I can interrupt, because that, that's a very interesting point, and we'd love to hear from you and Aram on this, but you know, you just said a few thousand really good qubits, you could do something pretty amazing, and yet we're so used to hearing from you know, Intel and TSMC, et cetera, that you know, we want a Moore's Law-like scaling, and we're up to a billion, 10 billion, even now 100 billion transistors um, so what is more important? Is it the number of qubits you have or the quality of those qubits? What is the interplay there? Like what, what is the premium in a quantum computer? Yeah, I guess, uh, I guess all of it, right? So you need, you need a lot of qubits that can run for a long time. And you also want to be able to control them. You know, you want to be able to, you know, have, have reasonable enough control over them. And running for a long time means that the error rate has to be low enough. Uh, one thing that gives us hope that this is possible, because it is hard to make, to con you know, this combination of being able to control it, as Paolo was saying, and also isolate it from the environment, you kind of, having one or the other is easy, right? Having both is, is the challenge. Uh, so it's quite difficult to make the error rate small. One thing that gives us confidence is we know that there are quantum error correcting codes and that if the error rate is low enough, you can correct errors faster than they accumulate. That's called fault tolerant quantum computing. So this was known to work theoretically and people have started demonstrating it in experiments. Uh, and so this gives us hope that, this, that scalability is ultimately possible. Um, but it does require yeah, having enough qubits and running it for, for a long enough time uh, and having the keeping up the controllability while making the base error rate small. So kind of all these things have to work at the, at the same time, which is part of why these modular structure that we might need for further scalability hasn't been people's top priority. There's just a lot to juggle already, getting these different components to, to work together, uh, that just having one module with on the order of 100 or a few hundred qubits has been you know, people have been happy to, to get that working well for now before going to the, to the next stage. Yeah, uh, it's, it's interesting to think that, you know, a transistor has an error rate better than one part in 10 to the 20th power. We're just so used to it being perfect that the only metric that matters is how many of them do I have? Right. As opposed to quantum computing, which is so nascent, it's, 
how good are my qubits and also how many do I have? And so when we hear that you know, a company says, hey, we got 400 qubits now, we still have to ask, okay, how good are those individual qubits? Because we know they're not perfect. Yeah. Right. Yeah, classical computers have this, this property where if you just make the wire fatter, then you're adding more redundancy, right? So if you think about a transistor, or maybe a little bigger than a transistor, like a, a flip-flop that's zero or one, you have thousands of electrons going one way for zero to encode zero, thousands of electrons going the other way to encode one. So you could think of that as at the lowest layer, there is a physical error correcting code there, just it's the repetition code. And unfortunately, you can't protect quantum information with the repetition code. That's sort of the idea of Schrodinger's cat. You know, if you want to encode a zero as the whole cat is alive and a one as the whole cat is dead, that's a good way of storing classical information, but a superposition between those two doesn't last very long. And so that's sort of kind of the original sin of quantum computing. It's what makes it hard in the first place is that classical computers, you can just use repetition codes at the base layer, and it's a, a very simple technology, like a bigger wire. And, class, and quantum computers, there are codes that you can use at the base layer, but they're just already that base layer is a little bit more complicated. Uh, and people have demonstrated the building block, things like the surface code, are things that, that people can do in the lab and, and work, but yeah, it, we, we kind of, right, right off the bat, just the fact of a classical transistor is a, something we don't have the quantum analog of, which, which does hurt us. Would anybody like to add anything? <laughs> okay, so, so maybe, maybe I'll return to the question for Kevin um, on superconducting circuits and just say that Jeff's also an expert on superconducting circuits and he, he, he's worked on uh, natural atoms before. So I'm gonna ask him in a moment about <laughs> natural atomic systems. But let's, let's think in, in the context of MIT.nano and how it helps us. And so, so getting back to the question we had before, Kevin, you know, what is a superconducting circuit and how does MIT.nano help us build these superconducting circuits and how are they quantum mechanical? Okay, perfect, thanks Will. Okay, I didn't escape for long, so let's go. Okay. Um, so I, I still think it's mind blowing that you can make, you can describe just normal electrical circuits quantum mechanically. Like if you take a, a capacitor and an inductor and, and wire them up, or if you take a, uh, an empty soda can and, and send electromagnetic waves into that, you can describe this state quantum mechanically. At room temperature, you typically don't see quantum mechanical behavior because um, there are so many thermal excitations. At room temperature, at microwave frequencies, for example, there are around 1,000 thermal excitations, 1,000 photons per, per mode. But once you cool this down to, say, 20 millikelvin, then you have a negligible amount of thermal uh, excitations, and you can um, generate single photon level excitations and actually coherently control the quantum state of these objects. So this gives you a controllable quantum system but now you have to make it into a qubit. And to do that, you need something called, or you need a nonlinearity, which breaks the degeneracy between the levels, or in other words, just allows you to, to, to control it more easily. And that nonlinearity comes from, that we use comes from uh, something called the Josephson junction, which is something that forms at the interface between a superconducting metal, a, a oxide a dielectric barrier, and another superconducting uh, metal. So with, these tools making basically LC resonators and making these nonlinear LC resonators with Josephson junctions, we can wire these together and, and create superconducting quantum computers. And the way that MIT.nano enables this is, so I think superconducting quantum computing, it's, it's going through this transition where a, a lot of the, the biggest quantum computers are being built in industry now. And this is something that's just been happening over the past, say, five, 10 years. And that's also leading to some um, consequences where the complexity of these systems is really rising rapidly. For example, you know, and, and a lot of folks in, in um, classical computing might, might laugh at this, but the processes are starting to need things like uh, through silicon vias, starting to need things like air bridges, starting to require more and more levels of processing. I would say the number of process steps is still below that of a classical computer by, by far, but each of these processing steps needs to preserve the quality of the materials. The, in other words, the, the quality factor of the, uh, the things that come out of it at the end 
um, it needs to be, say, one to 10 million. So each of these processing steps has to be very precise. And this is really getting out of the realm of uh, complexity that a single academic lab having their own tools can, can handle. So this is being dealt with in a few different ways. Part of the field is shifting towards kind of a foundry model. For example, at MIT Lincoln Labs, they, they have a, a, essentially a small superconducting qubit foundry where, where they can take users' designs and, and build these things. And this is you know, a tremendous resource that uh, my group, uh, Will's group, uh, uses and others in the community. But I think to really get, um, to harness the power of students, to harness the power of students to innovate, you really need to allow them to get their hands dirty, try new things, try all their crazy ideas before this goes into a foundry level process. And that's what, particularly in the last six months, uh, my group along with the uh, uh, Engineering Quantum Systems group has been um, working on at MIT.nano, uh, building these superconducting quantum processors using the state-of-the-art fabrication techniques in MIT.nano. So um, we're, we're really excited to, to continue. And pursuing that. So, so just to, to clarify, you said an LC circuit, nonlinear inductor with mm -hmm. a capacitor forms a quantum system. Yes. But are these weird materials? A superconductor sounds weird. What, what materials are we talking about here? Oh, yeah. So these are, these are very not weird materials. So, so you can make all sorts of weird superconducting materials, high temperature superconductors. Uh, uh, but our, our superconductors, because of this need to get rid of all the thermal excitations, we can use very simple materials. For example, we can use high resistivity silicon wafers, we can use aluminum as our superconducting material, we can use the native oxide of aluminum as the, the oxide for the tunnel barrier. Um, I think there are a lot of opportunities for using new materials, although the, the, I would say the leading materials are pretty simple. But there's also a challenge that I think we have to be aware of, that the bar for new materials is really, really high. We need, as, as, as everyone here has mentioned, we, the quality of qubits needs to be extremely high. You need this um, quality factor of, of millions. So a material that is going to replace these leading ones, it has to be better not only in whatever unique property, such as it reduces one noise source, but to, to be an attractive candidate, it has to really be better along all axes. And this is, this is a really challenging problem that I think we as a community um, have to try to overcome. So it sounds like superconducting circuits are a silicon technology that use silicon manufacturing tools using silicon CMOS compatible materials like aluminum and aluminum oxide and to, to make quantum systems. And we call these artificial atoms, I guess, because they behave like atoms, but they're really just electrical circuits. And so, Jeff, tell us about natural atoms, the ones that we all know from the periodic table. How do we use those? In a, and, and how would a place like MIT.nano help us with um, realizing quantum computers with natural atoms? Sure, yeah, I think natural atoms in some sense are the original qubit. Um, like Paula mentioned, uh, things like MRI are measuring spins in our bodies, which are just like individual uh, nuclei, for instance, and if you look at the periodic table, you could pick certain atoms like rubidium or cesium uh, that uh, through their quantum energy levels, you can find two that will form your qubit uh, that you can use for computation and control. And typically, the way that you have to um, manipulate and control them is through lasers. Um, so neutral atom quantum computers today uh, you, you focus a laser beam down to a really, really tiny spot that's like a micron or, or so in size, and that focused laser beam actually allows you to confine a single atom in that beam spot. And it's called an optical tweezer. It's a technology that's also been used in like biological physics to study how RNA and protein uh, folding can happen. Um, and then you can make an array of all these laser spots, and so now you trap 100 of these atoms in some grid, and the cool thing using bulk optics, you can move them around dynamically, so they don't have to be fixed in a grid. You can make triangles and zigzags, and you can bring two atoms together to make them interact, and then move them apart to make them not interact. Um, and through this, you make a, a quantum system that you can control and perform algorithms on. Um, and I think from the perspective of where nano could help um, neutral atoms is that like a lot of the 
things I've described with my waving hands are bulk optics, uh, like big crystals that are used for beam deflection or, or bulk optics for focusing laser beams. Um, but there are certain active optical elements, um, like uh, little mirror arrays that you could use to create complicated beam patterns or to improve the quality of, of, uh, of optical beam spots. And there, I think leveraging actual dedicated fab to do that um, would be exciting. And I think you know, a lot of folks in Dirk England's group are, are working on shrinking these bulk optics to things that are chip scale um, to try to make it a more scalable technology. Because if you look at a, a typical neutral atom lab, there's this huge optical table full of mirrors and lenses that you have to turn with knobs in your hands. And, and I think to commercialize something like this, we'll want to shrink a lot of that down. Um, so you're talking about integrated optics. Yeah, integrated in optics. Silicon. Yep. And so again, it's a silicon technology that uses CMOS tool set to hold atoms in free space and, and realize a quantum computer. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's really <the> cool. <laughs> um, we have a few questions that have popped up, and maybe, maybe I'll start with one that, uh, for Aram, because um, you know, we, we hear about von Neumann machines, and uh, maybe what's that, and, and what's a quantum computer, and, and is a quantum computer a von Neumann machine, and if not, what is it? So with, you know, with the online questions, you can't have a back and forth with the questioner. My guess is that von Neumann architecture means the conventional CPU stored memory type, uh, you know, the, the conventional model of computers that we have. And that interface between classical computers and quantum computers is something that we have to keep getting better at. I think right now we have not heavily optimized it. One thing that's going to happen with fault-tolerant quantum computing is that with our current computer, quantum computers, maybe you initialize it, you do a bunch of operations, and then you measure. The measurement's destructive. You measure all the qubits. You, and then you, you analyze the data. Fault tolerant quantum computing has to go beyond that. You have to be constantly measuring some of the qubits in order to diagnose the errors. And then you feed back, you send that to a classical computer to, to read what's called the syndrome, figure out what the error is, and then calculate the way to correct it on the quantum computer and feed that back in. So in real time, you're measuring and the output of that is, is affecting your quantum computation. Uh, actually, we should also discuss ions versus superconductors. Yep. This is one place where the slow speed of ion trap quantum computing uh, makes life very good for them because they're slow compared to a gigahertz classical computer, and so that's fine. On a superconducting qubit, they're very fast, which in most ways is good, but it does mean that the classical computers have a hard time keeping up with them, and that's going to be one of the architectural challenges going forward is, you know, how do you... Uh, do you integrate the classical computing with the superconducting qubits uh, using superconducting logic? Is cryo CMOS going to help? There's some big challenges there. You know, a lot of these are not very mature computing technologies. And so integrating that is, is definitely going to be uh, an ongoing challenge. That's, that's a great point, too, which is, you know, we've been talking quantum, quantum, quantum this whole panel session, but the fact is, is that if we're going to build a system a lot needs to go into it, and it's not just quantum pieces, but you just mentioned classical control technology, and, right. and Jeff, you mentioned integrated optics. Um, and this, this also seems like a place where nano um, will definitely contribute to the scaling or the extensibility of quantum systems. And maybe I can just follow on with sensing. What does that look like on the sensing side? Is, is there a similar need for these um, surrounding classical technologies to enable Quantum sensing? Yes, definitely. I think that there was actually a question which popped up and uh, got, uh, oh no, it's, it's there, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that uh, definitely for sensing, um, a lot of sensors that you would like to have are uh, down at the uh, micro scale or at least uh, millimeter sizes. And currently, uh, a lot of the prototypes are instead, for example, on a big optical table or, or uh, they're in any case uh, uh, relatively uh, uh, large and cumbersome. Um, I think that, yes, we, we need like a strong uh, efforts in that direction to shrink down. I don't think that there are um, like super fundamental problems, uh, but it's also a little bit, uh, in my point of view, uh, um, a problem of wills. Uh, 
people who are developing this sensor were uh, typically uh, working, um, like they, they love quantum mechanics, at least that's uh, what I do, uh, and <laughs> they might be uh, less interested in uh, actually working on the more uh, technological side to develop these uh, uh, nanostructured um, devices. And so there is uh, really a need of a stronger integration uh, between uh, people developing the more fundamental idea for quantum, people developing uh, the technology which will make uh, actually these devices uh, practical, um, and also the users, especially for, for sensing, so that we actually uh, sort of develop the sensor that people will want to uh, use, and not the sensor that we think it would be cool to, uh, to do. So uh, uh, there is definitely uh, a lot of needs there, and I think that indeed uh, MIT Nano can uh, allow these uh, uh, sort of interfaces between people to uh, bridge uh, the problems here. Okay, um, I see a question that has some several upvotes, uh, LK99, which w there was some hope that that would be a room it. temperature superconductor. <laughs> Turns out it's not a superconductor, unfortunately. You know, my brain said no, but my heart said yes. I was really hoping that it would be. But it does raise an interesting question, which maybe I'll address to Kevin and um, Jeff. For superconducting circuits, why not just use the highest temperature, you know, critical temperature superconductor possible in, um, and does it matter? Yeah, so I, I, absolutely. So I guess, yeah, for, for this one, um, I mean, there are a, a lot of room temperature semiconductors, so I guess that's not so exciting. Um, but um, so regarding the material, so as I was mentioning earlier, it's not enough to just increase the operating temperature of your superconductor. So that's one of the things, one of the reasons why we have to go below the superconducting transition uh, um, temperature of the material. But the other is about the, the number of thermal photons. And as you increase in frequency, the number of thermal photons decreases. That's why optical quantum computers um, optical frequency quantum computers they actually have promise of room temperature operation, which is, is super exciting. Um, whereas superconducting quantum computers, um, especially the ones operating in, say, the 10, 1 to 10 gigahertz range, even if you had a room temperature superconductor, you couldn't operate it at room temperature. What you can do is you can potentially um, push up the um, frequency, operating frequency of these devices, if rather than, say, operating it from 1 to 10 gigahertz, they operate it at 100 gigahertz or 200 gigahertz or 300 gigahertz, then maybe um, temperatures such as 4 Kelvin would be uh, in a realm of possibility, and this could, um, this could reduce a lot of the cost of quantum computing. Uh, you have a lot more cooling power if you're able to work at 4 Kelvin. You're able to better interface with uh, cryo CMOS, better interface with, um, with SFQ, classical superconducting control hardware. So I think there are really strong motivations to do that, but I don't see superconducting quantum computers ever operating at, at room temperature. That's more for optical systems. Why, why don't we just go to 200 gigahertz? Let's just do it. What, what's the problem there? Uh, so, um, so, so I guess it's electronics are more expensive. We're really you know, leveraging a lot of the recent innovations in, in microelectronics, for example, like uh, the hardware developed for 5G and, and beyond, um, the RF socks. Um, all the control hardware, we're able to just directly buy these commercial off-the-shelf shelf systems. Uh, so people work on custom firmware for these, and, and we're able to use these to control the superconducting qubits. S and also, just uh, as you go up in frequency, as, as people in the audience know very well, packaging gets harder, control gets harder, measurement gets harder. So I think it's something the field is looking towards, but it's not a straightforward thing. And also, 200 gigahertz is, it will be uh, above, for example, the gap of aluminum, so you'll have to shift to, to different materials for that. So there are challenges. Not, not, not so simple. Or not, not so simple. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so it says question mostly for Kevin, but um, I'm going to also address it to Jeff. Maybe I'll start with Jeff. So, so what are the relative strengths and weaknesses of these technologies, superconducting qubits compared to trapped ions or spin qubits or neutral atoms? Like, mm -hmm. What do you think there? So yeah, superconducting qubits are nice because they are, as Will said, an artificial atom. We can kind of tailor design their uh, atomic, effective atomic properties just by changing electrical properties of the circuit. So that gives you a lot of controllability as a scientist to come up with a qubit that has the properties that you want. 
Um, we've also mentioned a lot clock speed. They have a fast clock, so the kind of typical gates or operations that I want to do on a superconducting qubit take maybe a few tens of nanoseconds, whereas on a, an ion trap, they could take uh, hundreds of microseconds up to milliseconds, depending on the specific type of architecture and, and these things. And so there, um, you know, the kind of practical impediment to running some complex algorithm starts to come into play. So even if we have some favorable scaling for doing something, the prefactors matter for real people running real things on, on real systems. So even if I have a, a computer that could give me a good answer, if it's going to take me three years uh, to do it, it's maybe not so useful. Um, and so I think that's where superconducting qubits can um, be better on one axis relative to something like an ion trap. Uh, but of course, ions have much higher quantum coherence, so that's you know, a, a check mark for them. Uh, so far, superconducting qubits, the, the highest coherence that we've seen is at the millisecond scale, whereas for ions, it can be uh, sometimes immeasurable. They can't measure long enough to figure out what the, the so-called T2 time of the qubit is, so it's basically infinity. Um, that's, very, that's a very nice feature to have. Uh, and then comparing to silicon quantum dots, um, I think they have a lot of the same benefits of superconducting qubits where they're, you know, you can use CMOS compatible technology to make them. Uh, they're very tailorable. Uh, they have fast clocks, um, but they also can suffer from low coherence time just because of the kind of messy surface physics that happens uh, in fabrication. And they also require a lot of control lines to, to control them. Um, yeah, Aram mentioned that there's this kind of effective one control line per qubit for superconducting qubits, and I think for semiconducting quantum dots, it can be 10 control lines per qubit or more. Oh, wow. Um, depending on, again, depending on the type, but it can be a lot. Uh, so we, we, I think we need to do a lot of uh, engineering work there to figure out this signal multiplexing issue. Yeah. Um, can I maybe add, um, so there are like all this technology, and I think that, uh, um, well, we don't really know uh, what technology is the winner, but uh, we also have to think that uh, we don't have just quantum computing. We also have our parts, and maybe I'm biased, of course, because my main work is in uh, sensing and simulation. So some of the uh, platform might be better for different tasks, um, like photonics for quantum communication, uh, some of the uh, defects, uh, uh, spin defects in solids for, for sensing, and so on and so forth. So it's, uh, I think, uh, very good at this stage to keep pushing all the technologies and also think about uh, uh, ways to integrate them to uh, sort of like exploit all the benefits that we might have in one direction or the other. So I wanted to add that. That's true. Again, not just that one is going to win, right? That they'll, different ones will be good for different tasks. Right. And one, one thing that's very exciting is transduction, the idea of taking quantum information encoded in one type of platform and, and transferring it to another one, which... Ah, so that sounds like networking. Yep. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So you can, you can send information from one quantum computer to another quantum computer. And why would you do that? Like, what, what's the advantage there? Well, I guess we mentioned modular quantum computers. You might say it's hard to scale up individual modules, but if you can link them together, then maybe you never need to make one module bigger than 200 qubits. So that's one. So it might be easier to make a exactly. smaller one than one giant big one. Right. Make lots of little ones and then network them together. And long range entanglement can also, I guess, have sensing applications. Do you want to say anything about that? Yeah. Well, um, yeah, so like uh, it can have both application on uh, just like sensing uh, distributed uh, signals, for example, astronomy. Uh, it's like a, a very simple uh, example. Uh, but also, uh, I think the integration between sensor, which might be deployed at a given location, and uh, a supercomputer, which is actually a quantum computer, would be very beneficial. So there is like uh, an intrinsic cost in, trans in transforming uh, quantum information into classical information and back back into quantum for processing. So we want to avoid that uh, uh, sort of like a bottleneck uh, through a classical transmission of information. So if you really can have a network of uh, quantum sensor connected to a quantum computer, it would be the best of, of both worlds. Yeah. And clock synchronization also, yeah. right? There's one, we'll get back to the questions in a moment, but there's a really important topic I wanted to cover, um, and, and maybe we can start with Aram. And, um, you know, sounds like we're not going to have a, a shore capable, shore meaning RSA crypt, cryptanalysis capable um, quantum computer for a while 10, 20, maybe even 30 years, who knows. Um, so, do I need to worry about security today? Like, 
can I just wait until that shore capable machine arrives and, and we'll figure it out then? Or do I need to be concerned today? You know, I think one thing that causes people to relax, you know, you see in Chrome, there's like that thing that's green and then it's yellow and it's red, it's pushing you to update. And it gives you the sense like, yeah, you know, when there's, if I just, if I need a quantum resistant crypto system, I'll just quit Chrome and reopen it and it'll, it'll put in the latest crypto system. Uh, but I think there are, there are other things like cars, satellites, pacemakers, where changing over the crypto system is, is not so trivial. And so we have to think about replacing RSA and, and elliptic curves and so on well before the, the big quantum computer comes. The other source of instability there is modular quantum computing. So once you get to a certain size, someone who is wanted to just throw money at the problem could build a lot of modules, right? So it's not like we're, right, so far we've had this evolutionary incremental increase of quantum computer size and quality, but it'll reach a threshold where error correction is possible. And it might not be economically productive to spend an enormous amount of money building a large quantum computer, but for a nation state that might be uh, something that, that would be, that they would want to spend the resources on doing. So I think shores could come faster than you think. Uh, and you have to prepare for it earlier than, you know, well before it arrives. The ethical, there's a, you know, a big, there are a range of societal challenges. I'll mention in a totally different direction, uh, because of the security implications among, you know, that's only one of the applications, but it has also led to, uh, to tension, especially between U.S. and China, and there's a the possibility of technology being restricted, uh, students having more trouble traveling between these countries. So that's something that, uh, that downstream of quantum computing that we also uh, have to worry about and, and think about you know, what, our, what our role is in. So, so I, I inferred from that, though, that there are, so, so RSA, elliptic curve, um, crypto systems are susceptible to attack by a quantum computer. But it sounds like there are other crypto systems which may not be susceptible to attack. Right, so people are, have, they've, for a long time there have been these lattice crypto systems which haven't been competi resource competitive with RSA, but would be more appealing because we don't have any quantum algorithms to attack them. But one, you know, one thing I think that people should know about computational complexity theory, no one has any proof that you can't factor numbers quickly on a classical computer, that you can't break a lattice crypto system on a classical computer. There's no proofs of any of this. All we have is that people have tried for decades you know, for factoring, arguably for millennia, to come up with fast ways of doing these things, and we've only made this much progress. So sometimes people will advance a new quantum-resistant crypto system, or supposedly quantum-resistant, and it turns out it's vulnerable to classical attack just because the total number of person hours spent thinking about it is just so small. So there are these ones that we hope will be resistant to quantum and classical attack, uh, but we definitely need to you know, to be thinking about this now. So many people are just doing both. Like you do classical crypto and, and post-quantum resistant. Yeah, two uh, locks on the door, right. Yeah. So if one of them breaks, you're, you're still okay. Exactly, exactly. Well, we're getting towards the end and I realize we didn't get through all the questions uh, here and uh, let me apologize for that as the moderator, but um, we'd like to cycle through each of our panel panelists and, and ask, I'm gonna ask two questions, uh, which you probably get asked every single time which is when are we gonna have a quantum sensor and when are we gonna have a commercial scale quantum computer and, and maybe your thoughts around that. So maybe we'll start with Aaron. Yeah, I'll, with quantum computing, I, I really don't know. I think in the next few years, we'll start doing things that, that you couldn't do classically that are of academic interest. Commercially, maybe 10 years, but it's, it's very hard for me to say. Um, that was the only question, right? Yeah. Paula? Paula? I will. Totally agree and uh, say in terms of quantum sensor, we already have quantum sensors. Uh, but I guess the question is, uh, how do we, when do we have them commercially available? And there are a, a number of startups which uh, are already out there and uh, sort of selling uh, their products in terms of uh, quantum sensor. I think that, uh, and, and also like uh, established industries that uh, are developing in-house uh, quantum sensors. Uh, so I think that this is like really, uh, um, like a, a bit more of a, about the market penetration and uh, really uh, adoption of the technology. Uh, but at the same time, we also still want to expand. I mean, uh, quantum computer is in some sense one 
of like you seen as a one task. You, you want to do quantum algorithm, quantum sensor. You have so many possibilities that uh, really there is no uh, ceiling in some sense. Kevin, yeah, I think I would guess a decade for for solving useful problems with commercial quantum computers, and as as others have said, you we have quantum sensors now. Um, I know for in some of the, the research that I do, like we are using quantum sensors to advance uh, quantum computing. So I think that's it's very much in, in something a lot of people are doing now. Yeah. Jeff, final word? I guess for a commercial quantum computer, I'll, I'll go slightly more pessimistic and say 15 to 20. 15 to 20 years, yeah. yeah one, to two, one to two decades. My expectation is probably much like conventional classical computing, it's going to evolve over time and it's gonna start effectively with hearing aids, to use an analogy, which isn't very powerful, but it was commercial and then eventually grows over the decades. And uh, hopefully we'll see that happen because it'll kick in a virtuous cycle of development. So with that, I would really like to thank um, our panel members. So please join me in thanking them. Thank